Thank you very much. Uh, hello and welcome to this webinar about the difficult glaucomas. And the term glaucoma itself is very difficult, so uh, it doesn't need any more complexity. However, uh, as glaucoma surgeons, we all meet uh, difficult situations, uh, very difficult glaucomas. And today we're going to explore uh, some cases and uh, discuss the management among us. And hopefully that will be uh, useful for those who are practicing glaucoma. Um, but Dr. Aktas, uh, Mustafa, can you unmute Dr. Aktas, please? And uh, and uh, I'm going to start. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Karim Tommy. Uh, Dr. Karim Tommy does need an introduction. Uh, he is uh, my mentor in glaucoma, and uh, he taught us uh, quite a lot of. Uh, wisdom actually, and in the management of glaucoma and other things. So please, Dr. Karim Tuami, would you go ahead with your presentation? Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Can you all hear me well? Yes, yes, we can, thank you. Uh, okay. I'm sharing my screen now. One second. Uh, good evening or good morning, uh, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, we have always wondered, especially as a tertiary care referral center, we get very difficult cases of glaucoma uh, what happens if nothing works and we frequently encounter such cases uh, so uh, the purpose here is to discuss these difficult glaucoma cases that cannot be controlled even after having undergone multiple uh, procedures and uh, Without any further delay, I would just like to, to stimulate the discussion by presenting a case where nothing worked actually, and finally something that we did not expect to work, did work. This is a 55 year old male who was first seen at the Beirut Eye Specialist Center in March of last year. And at the time he presented with something like conjunctivitis, and he had normal vision and uh, his pressure was well controlled on COSOP and Zalatan. He was a phakic patient with open angles and healthy looking discs. And then at some stage, the pressure went out of control and we could not control it by any means. And as this patient was living outside Lebanon and he was always eager to fly back to, to Africa, to the Ivory Coast. Ziad and I discussed it at length and we decided to, to start with things that did not need really uh, follow up because he was not going to be under our eyes after the treatment. So uh, a month later, we started by SLT in both eyes, did not work. Then we decided later to uh, implant a, uh, a valve in his left eye first. Again, the argument being that a valve does not require a lot of uh, follow-up and he could probably travel uh, soon after the surgery. And by the same argument, we decided to do GAT on the right eye. The left eye that had the valve went up again and we could not control it medically. So again, we tried something simple, uh, needling of the, of the capsule around the uh, plate with mitomycin injection did not work. And finally, we decided to, do, to go for the micropulse cyclophotocoagulation first on the left eye and then later on on the right. Unfortunately, and I keep repeating myself, did not work. Pressure pressures remained poorly controlled despite maximal treatment, including 
oral diamonds. So, what would you do next? I'm open to suggestions. Well, I, I, I know how the case went, so I cannot, I cannot give any suggestions. So uh, what about Mustafa, Muhammad, Abdul Hamid? Any suggestion where to take it after this? Uh, you're talking about the left eye, which uh, you have both, performed the valve for it, both, Dr. Both, Karim. Both eyes. Both, both eyes. Both eyes were out of control in the 30s and the 40s. So can you address to us uh, which eye is the most important in order to start our uh, discussion? Which eye Let's do you want to address first? Well, uh, obviously, the, the eye with the Ahmed valve, you yes. know, can you, can leaves you, less room for intervention. Yes, can you explain to us how, how is his conjunctiva in the quadrants other than the it, valve? They were okay. So he has good conjunctiva. Yeah. Ah, and, uh, 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 and the valve uh, uh, lowered the pressure by how much degree? Uh, first, not, you know, first it went down as expected, but very soon the pressure climbed up again and we could not take care of that. But it reached with the valve first time to a target pressure that's accepted to you. Oh, yes. So I think you can start uh, with doing some sort of uh, transconjunctival uh, surgery. Uh, if his open angle with gonioscopy, I can proceed with deep sclerectomy in the other quadrant. Or uh, if the uh, angle is closed and you did already uh, get on, on this eye, you can proceed for another valve with uh, less conjunctival uh, dependence. Yeah, you see, the, the thing is, he, uh, his tissues react very violently, especially to the valve. So uh, we, we were not encouraged to, to implant another valve because we said, well, what if we get the same reaction? Perfect, so you did get for this eye? Yes, and micropulse. Get and micropulse. Yes. Uh, there is um, 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 a trend to use the um, thermal laser uh, cyclophotocoagulation with a more guarded uh, plan in the form of uh, putting uh, uh, four seconds, uh, 1.25 or 1.5 joule, six uh, applications per quadrant for mm -hmm. three quadrants without waiting for the pop. Yeah. This is a nice trend we are adopting nowadays and it's um, something between the thermal, traditional thermal and the micropulse and we find, get, and we are getting very nice results with it. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Other I suggestions? Second, I second what uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid just said. So uh, we call this the slow coagulation technique and this was... Uh, described, although not published, by um, uh, the Gasterland. And uh, we have published our results on comparing the slow coagulation versus the pop techniques. And, um, you know, they showed similar efficacy, although the safety profile was better uh, with the slow coagulation technique. And uh, we're actually uh, also in the process of publishing our manuscript on using the slow coagulation technique of continuous wave laser on eyes with good vision as a primary glaucoma surgery. Great. So could you, could you please get back to previous slides, uh, summarizing the uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. So we have a tube in the left eye yes. and, and you get and the micropulse uh, in the right eye, right? Yes. And they both failed. They both failed. Um, okay. Maybe, uh, maybe I could. I, I would uh, try. So, so you didn't do gats in in, in the left eye, right? Uh, no, no. No. Uh, 
Okay, maybe I can. Uh, maybe maybe uh, I would uh, I would try GAT in in left eye and just just try to see what happens in left eye. Then uh, maybe go for uh, micropulse. So, so you did micropulse once, right? Micropulse once, yes. One. Maybe uh, I can uh, I can try a couple of times. I don't uh, have micro. Paul, so I don't. Uh, so you, you guys have uh, Ziat, uh, and you guys uh, have uh, much more experience than me. Maybe, but I can go for GATS again in the other eye first, and then maybe add some micro pulse. So just uh, a question: is that one thing, uh, the fact that GATS did not work, work in the right eye, isn't it a predictive, uh, predictive of failure if you do it in the left eye, especially after a tube? Like it didn't work. In the right, why would it work in the left after Actually, a tube? Actually, yeah, you are right. This is a question in my mind. That's that's right. But I don't have a scientific data proving that. But but it's reasonable. Yes, uh, we should uh, we should work this. Actually, I don't have uh, data showing the 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 wound healing in the angle. So we don't have any idea. But the, yes, that's right. It's it's a question right now. It should be investigated definitely. But since it's uh, it has a non-invasive nature, you know, uh, I can ask why why don't why don't we try again and see uh, what happens, and then go for other techniques. But you're right. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to proceed. Uh, if nobody else has uh, comments, your your comments are very valuable. And you will see that we, we did what you suggested in one eye at least. Uh, I decided to go for a more classical approach for the right eye that does not have the valve. Uh, I proceeded with a with a fornix based trabeculectomy, uh, although I'm I'm fond more of a limbus based like Mustafa. Uh, and I used a heavy dose of mitomycin followed by several 5-FU injections uh, over two weeks. And the reason for this approach is because of the, our experience with the other eye having reacted so violently uh, to, the, to the presence of an Ahmed valve. So we anticipated another violent reaction and we, we treated them intensively with mitomycin and 5-FU. And the reason I'm specifying fornix based because I figured it involves less dissection and uh, less stimulation of the tissues and less fibrosis. And sure enough, uh, as of day one, he had a, a deep chamber with a good blood and a pressure in the high teens, low twenties that responded readily to focal massage. And with repeated massage and uh, uh, repeated five a few injections, uh, he, he maintained a good pressure uh, in the low teens. And uh, as uh, some of the colleagues suggested, we did a slow burn of the, using the diode laser on the left eye that had the, uh, the Ahmed valve. And the post-operative follow-up, the pressure was always 8 to 10 millimeters in both eyes on no treatment. The right eye has had a diffuse, thick bleb becoming gradually avascular as it received uh, treatment. And he was followed up, up until mid-June, a few days ago, uh, when he had to go back to Africa. And actually, only yesterday, he sent me a message uh, saying that his pressure using the air puff tonometry in, in, uh, in, in the Ivory Coast was 13 and 14 meters in the right and, and left eyes. So in the interest of saving time, and maybe we can do some further discussion at the end, let me just uh, uh, summarize the messages uh, that can be learned from this uh, case, that trabeculectomy is still an option and the short-term morbidity can be minimized with meticulous technique and vigilant follow-up. Now, the reason we did not think of trabeculectomy as one of the options initially is because this patient was, was always eager to go back and he said, I'm traveling next week, next week, you know, the, the airport is closed and they kept promising that it will be open and so on. So 
that's why we elected to choose procedures that did not require a lot of follow-up like, like trabeculectomy, which has the longest track record and can be working for years and, and years. And we're always afraid of long-term complications, but to my mind, these can always be managed. And I must admit that we always have trabeculectomy in the back of our minds when we keep wanting to spare the superior conjunctiva for future surgery by doing clear cornea phacos, by going to MIGS instead of conjunctiva uh, involving uh, uh, procedures. So I'm not trying to defend TRAB as an exclusive choice, but always keep it in mind, at least until we identify safer and equally effective uh, procedures. I just wanted to throw in this uh, case uh, to, to, to stress that we often forget classical approaches uh, in favor of uh, more modern uh, procedures. Both are justified, but we have to individualize our cases. Thank you. Uh, maybe we ought to leave uh, additional uh, discussion at the end and uh, give a chance for the other uh, colleagues. Th thank you, Dr. thank you, Karim. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful and classic uh, teaching. Uh, that's what I do myself. I learned that from you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll go ahead now and uh, share my screen. Uh, I hope I can. Uh, oh. Uh, let me see. Okay, and uh, oh dear. Mm. Sorry about that. Here we go. All right, and we'll go from there. Right, this should be very short. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, Dr. Mustafa. Good, thank you very much. Uh, what is the approach to the patient with advanced or end-stage glaucoma? Um, I have you, a lot of those you here. You can't see your screen, Dr. Mustafa. I think you shared the wrong screen. Uh, so if, you, if you go uh, back to way, your screen and choose the, the window that, uh, that has your presentation. Oh, I see. Um, stop sharing and share. And the window was my presentation. Can you see that now? Yes. Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, right. I have a lot of uh, patients. I, I was faced with a, a horrible number of patients uh, uh, here in, in Sudan and people coming from other parts of the Arab world uh, with very advanced glaucoma and stage glaucoma. Uh, and uh, I'm going to share with you some very simple tips that I, I use when uh, seeing those patients. Uh, advanced glaucoma, by definition, chronic or, or angle closure or open angle glaucoma, advanced visual field loss, independent, inadequate intracranial pressure control on maximum treatment, even with previous surgery. Risk factors include age, ocular pathology, and systemic um, diseases. Uh, all of these things can actually make your life harder. Uh, you've had a marvelous trap, and then the patient developed a bad cataract, waited until the cataract was solid rock, and then came to you. Uh, retinal vasculopathies are very common in this part of the world. And, and the most important risk factor for me here is family support, uh, because that will indicate to you how much care this patient will have after surgery. Uh, I depend on assessment of the patient. Uh, I depend on visual acuity, visual fields, optic nerve, and then there is a functional reserve of the eye and the health or vision-related quality of life. There is no point of operating on, on somebody who's hand motion, for instance, uh, and, uh, and hoping that for that vision, I'm sorry, for PL and hoping for that vision to, to improve. Uh, uh, but if there is enough functional eye uh, and, and he can depend on that to carry on a healthy life, sort of, and then yes, I would go ahead with that. So for that, we need to test the visual fields if, if possible, uh, the visual perception, and sometimes because some of those patients have had have, have developed cortical pathology that will, will not enable them to actually uh, uh, perceive well. 
his visual needs. Uh, some some people are professors at the university. Some people are are farmers, and and that has to be put into consideration. And uh, of course, his their personal ability and attitude. Uh, we have functional vision. People rarely come to me in that stage. Useful vision, maybe, and ambulatory vision. That's what most people come in with. Uh, maybe visual independence, or uh, and uh, and we need. To, we need to provide visual independence and avoid self neglect negligence. Uh, how to maintain it without adding morbidity? Maybe sometimes you don't have to interfere because you'll add a lot of morbidity without any use. Uh, how can we help improving his health related quality of life is one of one most important question. Um, now, visual, visual fields are not very reliable and uh, we have to decide every time is the pattern corresponding to pathology or not, because as you can, as you know, uh, glaucoma can be mixed with uh, cerebral cortex infarction, and, and we wouldn't know. One of the little tricks that I use all the time is to change the spot size in advanced patient. This patient um, had such a field, uh, and she was really depressed, uh, being tested by size 3 every time. And then when I changed that to size 5, uh, life became a lot better, and she was more compliant with her medications and her whole life improved just because of we, we changed the spot size to five, which of course covers a lot more, three times more than the uh, three uh, uh, receptive fields. And, and that helped her quite a lot. Uh, also, I use, uh, I use uh, when I decide on surgery for advanced cases, I depend mainly on the central 10-2 uh, visual field, because as you can see, this is the amount of spots, about 16 spots being tested when you use the 30-2 visual field. However, if you use the uh, uh, central 10-2, uh, there's a lot more visual uh, uh, appreciation in that area. And, uh, and this, this, this central area, this central small, about uh, maybe one or less than two millimeters in the eye, uh, rep is represented in the brain and uh, in, in the visual cortex by about 60% or more than 60%. So um, that's a very important area for the patient. And uh, here is a patient with central fixation. Uh, I mean, the loss has approached central fixation, but when we used uh, the central 10-2, uh, it became quite a different story. Uh, for, for the first one, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't touch this patient, but here, for fear of, of wipe out. Uh, but here, this is the real thing. This is a central 10, and as you can see, uh, it's not really uh, cross-fixating, and I can go ahead uh, at ease. Um, despite normal intraocular pressure, people lose their sight to glaucoma. Uh, you need to think of vascular risk factors, importantly, very much diabetes, uh, new ocular pathology, the patient has developed retinal vascular occlusions, and you need to redefine your target intraocular pressure, of course, all the time. Um, again, I, I have a lot of patients referred on medical glaucoma and for years, and they were told that they have a very bad disease. And they all turned out to be congenital anomalies and stuff like that. So you have to make sure still in, in, in a very advanced patient, uh, it referred to as advanced glaucoma, is it still glaucoma or not? Now this, this patient developed uh, retinal vasculitis, secondary to uh, sarcoidosis. And uh, of course his life and, and the, the fluorescent and geography, you can see the uh, communications uh, between the superior and inferior parts of the temporal retina indicating chronic uh, ischemia. And then all of a sudden he developed vasculitis as well, which added to his misery really, but that was not, that's drop of vision not related really to the glaucoma itself. Uh, here's a patient, male 55, diagnosed with glaucoma for one year. Uh, family history, very strong for glaucoma. The intraocular pressure at diagnosis was 14 and 18, right and left. And then when he came to me, he, it was 12 and 14, ombitoptic and travertan. His visual acuity was 6, 6 in the right eye, encountered fingers in, uh, at two meters in the right and the left eye. And this is the visual field. I mean, you cannot have such a central loss stage in, in glaucoma. Uh, it's unless you, the patient is blinded by glaucoma. But to have the visual field effect uh, that was uh, in May and in December of the same year, he's improved. So his performance has improved. But but this was a classic uh, traumatic uh, optic neuropathy rather than glaucoma, and it looked just like glaucoma. So when do we operate? We operate when there is progressive visual function loss despite maximum tolerable treatment, controlled systemic disease. You have to control systemic disease. Sometimes I start people with insulin, uh, diabetics not really controlled, but okay. Uh, I start them on insulin uh, for, in order to, to, to enter an eye which, which presents to me with a pressure of like uh, six something. 
and there is enough functional reserve to maintain a health-related quality of life in the eye. The most important item here is repeated discussion with the patient and the family regarding the risk and morbidity of the surgery. Because if you don't do that, people think that once you do the, I mean, some people ask me, are you going to do it with laser? Uh, that, that tells you how much um, ignorance is about in the society about uh, uh, doing uh, glaucoma surgery. So you have to have this detailed, repeated discussion with the patient and the family because the family are going to take care of him after the surgery uh, regarding the risk and the morbidity. This is a... Uh, I'm going to just view this. This is the lady. Uh, one of my uh, routine tests is to ask them to cover the blind eye by that time and ask her to use her only eye to go towards the door and uh, see if she can at least ambulate freely in the room. That means that she can uh, take care of herself. Nobody's guiding her. She just came back to the, notice her head. I mean, she's making sure of every step. That's because of the very, very small remaining visual field. But this lady uh, had surgery and, and she went okay. Uh, the, um, I think we need to stop this. No. Now, uh, visual acuity, if head motion or counter fingers at close distance, I, 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 I wouldn't uh, touch it. High intracranial pressure, yes, that's not a problem. No renal impairment then I will go for an aggressive lowering of the intracranial pressure. And how do I do that? I give it azithromycin, the uh, Diamox, 250 milligram uh, tablet QID for three or four days, and then ask them to go home, rest, and then come back to me in three days. And I test the pressure again. If they have a good response, then uh, I would, I would uh, go ahead with that, um, with surgery. Uh, if there is visual improvement, if there is lowering of the intracranial pressure, because sometimes you do that and the pressure never goes down. And the vision really is the same, head motion as, as it was, or counter fingers at close distance. Now, regarding the anesthesia, I have a very low, low tolerance approach with advanced disease. So if general anesthesia, no hypertensive tricks at all. You don't need, I mean, some, some anesthetists would, would, like, would love to actually uh, make the patient hypertensive, but we should avoid that by all means. Uh, because that's very harmful to the cerebral circulation, something that you count on. If local anesthesia, please, no retrobulbar injections at all of any sort, uh, because in all kinds of glaucoma, and all kinds of patients with glaucoma, especially advanced glaucoma, the, the uh, retrobulbar circulation is really badly affected and compromised, and I wouldn't add any volume to that uh, small volume behind the eye. Uh, my approach is slow lowering of the intracranial pressure using uh, mannitol, 200 milligrams uh, over 20 minutes or so, using very, very uh, uh, slow paracentesis that I'm going to show you that, and using uh, some uh, tricks with a square flat dissection. By all means, avoid hypotony. Avoid hypotony, avoid hypotony. At the start of the surgery, at the middle of the surgery, at the end of the surgery, avoid hypotony. And always watch for uh, horrible things that might occur like malignant glaucoma or choroidal hemorrhage, God forbid. So uh, this is a video of uh, the paracentesis. I know you guys don't need that, but maybe some of our colleagues are not glaucoma surgeons. Um, I go very slow and, uh, and slow motion, slow motion, slow motion, and then I get really slow and then get inside the eye and open and get out with a very small drop of fluid coming out. I test the pressure. If I'm happy that this is okay, if not, um, I can test this opening. This is a small spatula and it doesn't go through, which means that the opening is really very small and self-sealing. Self-sealing is a point because uh, this is my target because otherwise uh, I don't want any leaks. I, in this case, we went too low and I, so I increase it a little bit and that's the pressure that I can work on. At the end of the surgery, uh, I use the same opening to reform the anterior chamber and the blood and watch carefully for a few minutes, making sure that the anterior chamber depth is maintained and the blood height is maintained. And that would be uh, for me the end point of the surgery. Right. So uh, again, uh, here is another trick. We, I do dissection like a sclera flap like everybody. And then it's a very old thing that I, I was taught uh, back in the 80s. Uh, put a stay suture. 
or garbage suture. It's there. Once I finish my business inside, I very quickly, I put it, I put some air here to watch for corridors. Uh, and then I closed it, then on nylon. That makes my life very easy, uh, very easy when I try to insert uh, uh, removable sutures. It, it makes it very easy and very precise at the same time. And here we go. And you, ca you can just get rid of this if you wish or keep it. And that's that. Um, is, is surgery enough? Sometimes not. Um, it depends on the final post-operative intracropatia and the visual function, of course, and how much did we uh, retain. Uh, it's either stabilized with a slower rate of disease progression or, of course, worsening or improvement, which doesn't happen really, except very rare. Now, in conclusion, uh, you need to confirm diagnosis. Funnily enough, in some of those cases coming with advanced glaucoma, you still have to confirm the diagnosis because it might not be glaucoma at all. Uh, you have to check for the impact of associated pathology in the eye and, and systemic pathology. Quality of residual functional vision. Um, you cannot go fly, fly a, an airplane after uh, having your vision drop as such and you have to maintain a lot of life and so on. You advise the patient and the family. Planning for intervention, increased morbidity, improved health and quality of life and share knowledge with the family as much as you can. Uh, thank you very much. That's the bit. Thanks so much, Dr. Mustafa. Okay, any comments from uh, our panelists on Dr. Mustafa's approach? I am. I am. Uh, uh, okay, Dr. Muhammad, I have a camera share screen. Karim is muted, Zainab is muted, Ziad is muted. Uh, hi. Hi. Mustafa, two things. Uh, I like to do my paracentesis inferiorly so that it is handy if I need to manipulate the, uh, the chamber post-op. That's number one. Number two, if you're keen on, uh, on avoiding hypotony, and of course you should be, how about using viscoelastic at some stage? That, that one was, uh, was, thank you very much, Karim. That one was actually inferior at six o'clock. It's just the, the way the video was put. But it, it's always inferior at six o'clock because I, I deal with it at the slip lamp. Uh, the other thing about uh, viscoelastic, of course, sometimes I do that, uh, but not all the times, especially when, when it involves something like uh, combined fecal trap. The last case I shared was a combined fecal trap, and I would like to observe, always observe that air bubble in the anterior chamber because if it gets flatter, then that means something is coming, pushing it from behind, and I should stop. Uh, I always watch, I always anticipate and watch for malignant glaucoma as well as choroidals uh, during glaucoma surgeries, especially with the kind of patients that I get. And uh, pre placing the sutures is, is quite vital, you know, because you can close immediately rather than yes. struggle with the eye while it's open. Absolutely true, yes. I spend as much short as time I can uh, and possible in, in the tea chamber and then uh, I, I close it immediately. So we have a, a question on the chat asking, you know, in, in advanced glaucoma surgery, why don't you go to deep sclerectomy as a safer alternative to trabeculectomy? This is one of the questions that came up in the chat. Well, uh, for two reasons. Thank you very much, Zed. Uh, for two reasons. One is um, I'm quite used to uh, trabeculectomy, of course. The other thing is uh, uh, it's been uh, proved uh, beyond uh, anything that uh, the complications, the complication rates and the complications themselves from deep sclerectomy and trabeculectomy are almost the same. Uh, so I, I prefer a trabeculectomy unless uh, I, I would go for a deep sclerectomy, for instance, combined with, uh, with uh, uh, trabeculotomy and congenital glaucoma, but not, uh, but not in, in, in my patients with severe glaucoma first. Do you, uh, would you, would you prefer, it's, it's, ex it's exactly the uh, same kind of question. Would you prefer some uh, minimally invasive glaucoma uh, procedures like suprachoroidals or GATS 
just to avoid the risk of complications to uh, you know uh, for for safety because in in, the, in those kind of uh, patients you know we have uh, yes risk of vision loss and we need low low target pressures so that's it but in other way uh, we have a high risk of surgical complications you know we we need to decide we need to uh, escalate some kind of you know so what what do you think about mix in those kind of uh, patients. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this, Dr. Zainab. Um, I, I did when I when I target for a pressure of uh, ten to eight, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't go for megs. Uh, ha having said that, I have to tell you that I, I've started doing uh, uh, GAT uh, about a couple of years ago, and in one of my cases, actually. Uh, I, I did two traps and then uh, instead of doing an Ahmed valve, I did a GAT inferiorly and it worked marvelously. Uh, but that was one patient, uh, so my, my GAT number is, is not that big. Uh, however, that worked for me. Uh, but uh, most of the time I'm targeting a pressure of eight, I go for trap, the way I, yeah. dis I discussed it. That, that's a great point. It, actually, it was my point. So we, we uh, mostly have an advanced cases and I have a, a experience most, I got the experience mostly in advanced cases we, and actually we, we published it. We have a data and it works very well in uh, advanced cases, especially in cases with uh, pseudo exfoliation. So it makes sense, you know, the patho primary pathologies and the trabecular meshwork and you incise it. Uh, in, the, in the health of the way or, or circumferentially. So it works very well, even in hemigap cases. So, uh, so I changed my approach in those cases. So I start with GAT first. You don't even need to do a circumferent 360 uh, trabeculotomy, you know. Uh, hemigap is uh, working very well in those cases. So, um, so uh, for safety, my approach is like that. I start with GAT in those cases. So uh, if it's not necessary, if uh, you don't reach the target uh, levels, you can uh, go ahead and add some medications instead of taking risks. It's um, good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, the kind of patients I have here are, are, are marvelously advanced, all of them. Uh, and uh -huh. those who are not advanced have nothing, have no glaucoma. I, I, I have two types of glaucoma patients. Those who don't have glaucoma at all, being treated for 10 years, and those with very bad disease coming to me with one single eye functioning. Um, mm -hmm. And, and if, uh, I've been doing a trap for more than 30 years, maybe 36 years or something, and I'm very comfortable with it. Um, however, uh, I have to tell you that in that case, which worked with me after two traps, it was a hemigap mm -hmm. because I had a, a nice, clean, uh, inferior uh, uh, half angle. Mm -hmm. of angle, and, and that was great. But that was yeah. one case. Um, I, I don't have much uh, experience in doing a lot of GAT on uh, advanced glaucomas because I, I, really, I really can't dare to, to do that in an eye that I know I can, I can serve better with uh, the technique yeah. that I am very comfortable with. Yeah, you, you can get low teen pressures or sometimes single digits in pseudo exfoliation. It works very well. Thank you, great points. I'll, 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Ziad? Hello? Yeah. Dr. Ziad, uh, would you like to go ahead? Uh, Ziad is going to tell us a story about a box of chocolates, I believe. So uh, <laughs> why don't you carry on and tell us the box of chocolate story? Ah, here you go. Box of chocolates. So you can see my, so you can see my slide? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mustafa, for uh, for organizing this. So m the title of my case today is going to be a box of chocolates. So this is the case of a 50-year-old uh, male who was uh, followed up at the Retina Clinic since 2012. Basically, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, CNV, uh, choroidal neovascular membrane for which he received uh, more than 20 uh, injections over uh, the course of three years. So from 2012 to 2015, he almost had 25 anti-VEGF injections and the IOP was uh, well controlled so far. And in 2016, they decided to switch him from 
uh, anti-VEGF injection to dexamethasone intravitreal implant injection. And in June 2016, so six months after his first um, dexamethasone injection, he started to develop an increase in intraocular pressure and they put him on, on glaucoma meds. Uh, after that, he underwent an uneventful uh, FACO with IOL uh, implantation, uh, and uh, he was well controlled on maximum tolerated uh, medical therapy with an IOP uh, that was in the in the mid to low teens uh, over uh, between 2016 and 2019. So three years on dexamethasone uh, injection with a well controlled pressure. Uh, with maximum uh, tolerated medical therapy. So when when you see that the pressure starts, when you see that the pressure starts to increase in those uh, in those cases, I think someone needs to mute their microphone. I hear someone speaking on the phone. So what I was saying is, you know, in, in some cases, when you, when you see those patients and you see that the pressure is started to increase and they start to need glaucoma meds uh, when they are taking those dexamethasone injection, you know that you are, you're in front of, of a ticking bomb. And this was exactly the case for that patient when they referred him to me after uh, two years of dexamethasone injection, the pressure was 42 millimeters of mercury in the injected eye on uh, MTMT, maximum tolerated medical therapy, including uh, oral uh, acetazolamide. So, you know, in, in those cases, when there is something that goes beyond a certain pattern, usually when you feel that there is something fishy or when you have a doubt of, that something is going on in glaucoma, usually it's true. So you need to follow, uh, follow your hitch. And th this is basically one of my favorite movies with uh, Tom Hanks, who's an amazing actor. And this quote that is really amazing is that his mama used to tell him, Forrest Gump, that life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. So whenever I'm facing uh, a patient like that, when I feel when my instinct tells me, you know, that there is something happening, you know, this guy has been having his injections for three years without any major problems. And now you have uh, this acute rise of intraocular pressure that is, uh, that is refractive to, to, all, uh, to all glaucoma medication. There's probably something new happening here. So I put my gonio lens as I do for every single patient that is, referred to me and I find this uh, little bad boy uh, sitting in the, in the inferior angle. So basically what you're seeing here is the dexamethasone implant that migrated into uh, the anterior chamber and it's sitting here, as you can see, just facing the inferior uh, trabeculum in the inferior quadrant. And probably, you know, the, the fact that this, this implant migrated in the anterior chamber was causing this uh, acute and violent uh, rise uh, in, in intraocular pressure. So the patient did not want to have any uh, type of surgery. He didn't want to have the, the implant removed. He didn't want to have any uh, glaucoma drainage device filtering surgery. He just wanted to wait for the implant to dissolve. We tried to consent him many times for surgery. It was basically impossible. So he basically agreed with the retina surgeon to come every other day to the glaucoma clinic, to the retina clinic. And he was having a paracentesis basically every, uh, every other day over the, la over the, la uh, the next uh, two to three weeks. And you can see that the pressure was at all visits somewhere between uh, 30 and 40. And then at a certain point, the dexamethasone implant was not visible anymore. Uh, on gonioscopy and we had to have you know this uh, discussion sit with our patient and tell him you know what the implant's not there anymore the pressure is not likely uh, to decrease but it was extremely difficult to convince him to have uh, a glaucoma surgery so what would be next you know in a patient like that uh, who's very difficult to consent for surgery uh, who's not satisfied with the safety profile of drainage devices or cerebrolectomy, what would you 
uh, what would be your go-to option to discuss with with such a risk-averse patient? Any comment, Mustafa? We, we can't hear you. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we uh, can. That, 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 that's a very tough one. Um, he, he's uh, refusing uh, uh, surgery, basically, right? I Any mean, type refusing... of... The we discussed trabeculectomy, we discussed drainage devices. He was not very happy with, uh, with the safety profile. Uh, how about cyclic or diode? That, that that would be an option, but I, I'm not a huge fan of diode and eyes do, that received uh, you know multiple injections. Hmm. You never know how they're gonna react. Yeah, I, I would. Uh, uh, well, if he's controlled medically, uh, then I would I would try to convince him to go for surgery. Really. Uh, either deep sclerectomy or trabeculectomy or, or a valve because that patient will continue coming back to you if you didn't do that. Is yeah, so the pr pressure was 40, 42 on maximum tolerated medical therapy, including uh, oral acetazolamide. Abdel Hamid, were you yeah. trying to comment? Yes, I just want to try at first to calibrate the risk for this patient, whether stopping his uh, steroids by any mean will keep him in a glaucoma state or will get him back to a normal intraocular pressure. So I want to ask about the other eye and his refraction and family history. Um, uh, um, things that will put him in high risk for uh, uh, steroid-induced glaucoma that will maintain forever. This is number one. Um, uh, number two, I, would ch I have um, uh, uh, performed a lot of uh, deep sclerectomies in steroid-induced glaucoma, and I published a paper. I will send it to you. It's uh, very safe uh, uh, because it's uh, a type of secondary open-angle glaucoma that does not put the patient in a state of hypotony. Um, uh, and it's marvelous. You are uh, promising him uh, a safe procedure. So I would suggest at first to calibrate the risk for uh, him to be steroid induced after uh, uh, the implant has gone away. Number two, uh, I suggest a, a non-penetrating surgery, especially that is uh, open angle. And I, I want to tell you uh, also that, with, that this was my adopted technique before going into the new angle surgery, like the elegant GAT, uh, that I can uh, uh, consider nowadays. Good point. What about you, Muhammad? What's what would be what would you do as a as a next step for the for this patient? What would you discuss with him? So, I know that GAT is a very uh, attractive option. Um, however, I know uh, th there is a recent publication by uh, my friend and mentor Peter Chang about GAT um, and whether it's actually better to use uh, uh, post-operative steroids versus uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. And uh, you know, I was aware of the results well before they were published. So the results were that actually patients who get non-steroidals after GAT do better than patients who actually get steroids after GAT. And, you know, we don't really know the mechanism, but maybe, um, like, steroids actually, um, you know, kind of like, you know, clog the uh, collector channels or something, like, you know, beyond um, the trabecular meshwork. So I'm not sure that GAT would actually be um, the best option in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a patient with uh, a known steroid induced component. Um, but I would certainly try GAT before anything else, though, having said that. Great, great point, uh, great point, Pamad. Uh, I don't know if Zainab's still on the, on the panel. Does yes. Zainab have any comment concerning yeah. steroid yeah. response? Steroid response after yeah. GAT. 
Um, it's a great case, thank you. Uh, for this case, I would uh, definitely try to convince this patient for the surgery. And I would go, the deep square to me uh, might be an option. And uh, and GAT might be definitely the option. And um, I have a subgroup of patients with steroid glaucoma, so it's uh, it works very well uh, also in in those cases. KDB might be another option. Uh, I would do GAT, and then uh, in the post early post op uh, period, uh, as I do in every patient, I would uh, switch. Uh, from uh, steroids to topical steroids to non-steroids as soon as possible to avoid uh, IOP peaks. Because these peaks uh, is very common in every patient, not in uh, those cases, you know. It's, it's very common, uh, like 20% uh, or 21% of uh, something like that in our uh, patient series. So uh, that's, that's what I would do. Great point, Zainab. Thank you. So, um, as you as you already suggested, we decided to to go for for a GAD. The patient was uh, was convinced with that option. He didn't want to live for the rest of his life with with a uh, with a tube in his eye, uh, and he was basically also afraid of bleb related complication with with trabeculectomy. So, GAD was um when we discussed the option GAT was the the most appealing option uh, for him you know the fact that it was minimally minimally invasive with a with a satisfying uh, safety profile so we decided to go for a GAT uh the evidence that we found in the literature back then was was not that significant there were two case report uh, one adult patient following uh, PKP uh, who had steroid response IOP of 48 went down to 13 after GAT. Another pediatric uh, case report, pressure of 38 went down to 12 uh, after GAT, also steroid response. And a retrospective study coming out of the US on 13 cases uh, with uh, steroid induced uh, glaucoma uh, undergoing GAT, you can see that. Uh, there was a major decrease in intraocular pressure in this in this study. Uh, baseline IOP was around 26, went down to around 10. So it's a uh, it's a good pressure reduction with a significant reduction in the number of glaucoma meds. And what's interesting in this retrospective study on steroid induced glaucoma uh, is that all those patients undergoing GAT had the pressure less than 15 at their last follow up. So we felt. Uh, we felt uh, quite positive um, about the outcomes of this type of uh, procedure. I'm going to show you the surgery in, uh, in this patient. So for those who are not familiar with the technique, what I'm doing here is that I'm opening a slit using an MDR. Uh, I'm incising the trabecular meshwork and I'm pushing the lip of trabecular meshwork. I'm pushing it down, exposing the back wall of Schlem's canal. And what you see here is the proline with a bulb on the tip. I basically cauterized the 5-0 proline to, to obtain this small bulb. And using MST microforceps, I slide uh, the proline suture in uh, Schlem's canal. And what you do here on the direct gonioscopic view is that you're going to do 30 to 40 one millimeter passes using your micro grasper and your proline suture is gonna travel circumferentially uh, 360 in Schlem's canal. And at a certain point, you're gonna see the tip of your, of your proline suture uh, getting there. And you push a bit more uh, to reach that slit, that opening that you created at the beginning of the surgery. And what I'm doing here is wrong. I should never reach underneath the proline to grab the, the bulb, I should reach above the proline because otherwise I would be risking to, to catch the iris with the micro forceps. And then I, I use a, mic, uh, a tying forceps to pull on, on both ends of the suture to do my 360 trabeculotomy, trabeculotomy. And this is what GAT is. And you have this beautiful reflux of blood from Schlem's canal, from the collector's channel that is a good prognostic factor. And I'm burping out my helon, and I have this beautiful uh, episcleral wave that indicates that there is some patency in the, in the outflow system. 
and this is also a good uh, a good prognostic factor. In one third of uh, the cases after GAT, you're going to end up having uh, a high FEMA, according to studies, and this is uh, our patient on post-op day one. You can see his high FEMA. I usually leave one third of a fill of AC with viscoelastic and an air bubble to tamponade uh, the bleeding and sort of uh, pushing it down in a way from the, the visual axis. And after GAT, over the next uh, two months, more or less, I had the pressure in the low teens. Uh, the, pressure, uh, the pressure was really well controlled. But then you see here on the last two visits, I had a drop of pressure. It was around five millimeters of mercury. The patient was not very happy with his vision here. So I knew that something fishy was happening. Usually I get pressures around 10 or low teens with GAD, but this was you know, way too good to be true. It was way uh, too low, basically. And I was telling you, in glaucoma, whenever you suspect that something uh, fishy is happening, it's usually a box of chocolate, and there's usually a surprise uh, in that box of chocolate. I couldn't see the fundus of the patient because he was on pilo. I usually put some of my patient on post-op um, uh, pilocarpine. So I ordered a B-scan, and unfortunately, the patient had... Uh, a retinal detachment, as you can see here. So I refer him back uh, to uh, to the retina clinic. He underwent a partial plane of vitrectomy, stripping of epiretinal membrane with gas injection and anti-VEGF, and the postoperative course uh, was uneventful. So just to remind you where we started with, the patient had an IOP of 42 millimeters of mercury on MTMT, including oral. Uh, acetazolamide and here we are uh, one year after uh, the surgery the pressure dropped from 42 to 9 millimeters of mercury so around 80 percent IOP reduction with a significant decrease in the number of uh, glaucoma med including this continuation of uh, oral acetazolamide and the patient is uh, quite happy with the, um, uh, with the results. So that was my case uh, for today. So basically when you're stuck in, you know, in some uh, unfamiliar scenarios, you should always look further for, you know, for something uh, happening that, that, that is causing, you know, this, uh, this unfamiliar or surprising reaction. Uh, and also you should try to think outside of the box, you know, not all, always go to the traditional uh, filtering procedure or drainage devices and think of other uh, new innovative uh, alternatives like GAT in those scenarios. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ziad. Uh, may I ask you a question, please? Um, what was the reason for the retinal detachment, do you think? I mean, you showed uh, us the surgery, it was marvelous. Well, very good question. You know, I discussed this at length with uh, with Zainab back then. You know, the, the retinal detachment happened two years after uh, two years after the um, the GAT procedure. The GAT procedure itself was uneventful. Uh, I think it was probably just bad luck. You know, he he had a retinal detachment that was unrelated to the surgery, given the fact that it was two months later. Uh, it could also be due to pilocarpine, but you know I think that you know retinal detachment caused by pilocarpine are are a big myth. I don't think that pilocarpine has a role to do with that. So I, I just think that it was ju just pure bad luck, unrelated to uh, to the GAT surgery. It was just a pseudophagic retinal detachment. Don't forget, he had multiple injections before. Multiple injections also could be could, could, could be causing you know vitreous movements or something like that. But it it has never been described you know retinal detachment as a complication to uh, uh, to get. I I know that Zena wrote a paper on choroidal effusions after uh, after anterior choroidal effusion after GAD, but this was you know. A, a regmatogenous retinal detachment, and we saw actually a retinal tear during uh, during the vitrectomy. Yeah, yeah, I can say a couple of things. They, I totally agree. You were just unlucky, I guess. You know, it happened two years after the gap, so 
so apparently uh, this has nothing to do with gas surgery. So her surgery is uneventful, so it was very smooth. So the, one of the risk factors is definitely, uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, the multiple intravitreal injections, I agree. And uh, when it comes to GAT, and as a complications, uh, we have a couple of patients, as, as you said, uh, with uh, supraciliary effusions, uh, and they were, and we published that, and they were totally normal patients, no any other predispositions, predispositions like uveitis or any, uh, and the surgeries are uh, uncomplicated surgeries. So this might happen in also uh, in patients underwent ab external trabeculotomy. So you can see some suprachoroidal uh, fluid uh, anteriorly and they resolve spontaneously, but retinal detachment is, is not, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, to, uh, to see in those cases. But one of the important thing is we, we need to keep our mind, keep, uh, keep on mind is uh, in patients uh, with uh, incisional, uh, with, a, with a history of uh, incisional surgery with PIs, sometimes it might, dur during threading, you need to uh, observe the tip of the suture if you are using. So it's kind of a uh, blind procedure. It might get into uh, the posterior segment sometimes. It happened to me and then I stop and draw the suture, you know. It might sometimes go get into the uh, the, the PI and and and, and uh, go to the back of the eyes. So in this clinical scenario, it might hit to the retina. So th it's possible, but uh, in this case, yeah. it has I think nothing to do with gut surgery. This is a great well, case. Thank you. Well, uh, th th there are a couple of comments on the chat, you know, saying that you know pilocarpine could mm -hmm. be the cause of of the retinal detachment. You know. This is the classical teaching, you know, in every textbook or every residence course, you know, they, they tell you that one of the complication of, of pilocarpine <laughs> could be retinal detachment. But we reviewed extensively the literature when we discussed that case with our retina specialist and we presented them during that case during many of our institution meeting. The, the evidence incriminating pilocarpine in the development of retinal detachment is only anecdotal. Uh, and if you go back to the literature, and I don't mean of, you know, textbooks that, that, that talk about that, but if you go back to the evidence, the evidence is very poor. Uh, and and most, of, most of the retina specialists would tell you that, you know, this is, this is not backed by, by, by real evidence and the reports are, you know, at most uh, uh, anecdotal. I, I, I don't know what uh Muhammad, what do, what, what do you what do you think would is there a relationship between myotics uh and and retinal detachment is it is it something that is scientifically agreed on i i actually have never seen a case this is something that like you know i've heard during residency in my residency exactly. years um, but it's really hard to believe that without a predisposing, a strong predisposing factor, like, you know, a, a, a tear or something, that, like, these by themselves would, would cause a retinal detachment um, out of the blue. Um, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and I agree that the evidence is, at best, anecdotal. I have asked several people, and they have not seen a single case. Totally agree with you, and and we we inject you know myocol in 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 I cataract surgery routine. Or myocol in every um, case of um, GAT on a fake patient, and then in every combined cataract glaucoma procedure, no matter what the glaucoma procedure is, is whether it's a MIGS or a tube. So after I'm done with my cataract portion, I inject myostat or myocol, and um, you know, of course, like, you know, in all fake GATs, I, I also inject uh, myostat or my uncle. By the way, uh, we, the old timers, and Mustafa can't uh, vouch for that, we lived with pilocarpine. At the time, we had pilocarpine, epinephrine, and diamox. That was about it. And by the way, you know, pilocarpine is still yes. one of the, of the most effective uh, drops for glaucoma for people who can tolerate it and it's Correct. cheap and actually dr karim uh, so th there are people who use uh, who still use uh, pilocarpine horn practice and i know them in, in um, teaching institutions here in the u.s who, who uh, prescribe pilocarpine regularly and others who prescribe phospholine iodide even and um uh, the the 
what also I have a particular use for pilocarpine in um, IOP spikes after GAT. And uh, this is not evidence-based, have seen it done, um, but um, this is something that works in my hands. When I have an IOP spike after GAT, I put the patient on uh, pilocarpine 2% QID, and you know, the vast majority, I don't have like, you know, numbers, but the vast majority actually uh, uh, go through the, the, the hypertensive phase and, and uh, regain of the pressure. Then, you great, know, you have, great point. You, you have the elderly uh, pseudophagic patients love it because it gives you the pinhole effect. And so, so many of them see better, actually. So the, thank you, Muhammad and Karim, for the, the great comments. So one, someone was asking on the, on the chat, why did the patient take pilocarpine drops after GAT? I think Muhammad answered that, you know, sometimes when the patient spikes after GAT, we use pilocarpine as a first line and, and you get really good IOP lowering effect with pilocarpine after GAT or even after KDB. Another comment in PDS, pigment dispersion syndrome, pilocarpine might have a higher risk for retinal detachment, I'm not aware of the evidence concerning risk of retinal detachment following with pilocarpine and pigment dispersion syndrome. Uh, I think that pilocarpine might prevent IOP spikes in pigment dispersion uh, patient by pulling the, the iris away uh, from the zonules. Sometimes you can give that to your patient before the workout or something like that. This is not evidence-based, but this is something that we've been most of us have been taught during our uh, glaucoma training. Uh, anyone familiar with, with the specificities, specificities of pilocarpine and pigment dispersion patients? Abdul Hamid, Muhammad, any comments on that? Um, actually, I, um, I have two patients with pigment dispersion and I adore uh, lens removal as early as possible as the um, sole and the most important uh, source of uh, friction between the iris and uh, while during meiosis and midriasis and have I have OCT for such patients and um, I found uh, by anterior segment OCT that it that there is a, a touch between the lens and the back of the iris which was totally uh, absent after replacing the crystalline lens even in clear lenses with IOLs. This is the main way for managing such patients as a starting step. Um, but I'm not used to pilocarpine because uh, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, available pilocarpine in Egypt yeah. nowadays. Uh, I would not advocate for uh, lens extraction as a first line for pigment dispersion when it comes to, 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 to my practice. Uh, what about you, Muhammad? Any any input on pilocarpine and pigment dispersion? Any comments? Um, I, I really am not sure. So we know that in pigment dispersion, we have this uh, posterior bowing of the iris. And uh, pilocarpine and all my, my, myotics would um, push the, the lens iris diaphragm forward. Uh, I just don't know the mechanics of it, how... Uh, it would affect the um, um, contact or friction between the iris, the back surface of the iris, and the uh, zonules. I'm, I'm not, you know, quite sure, to be honest. What about the comment of Abdel Hamid lens extraction? Would, you, would it be an option that you would consider? Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, we just need to um, remember here that pigment dispersion treats itself in a lot of patients. So um, particularly in, um, you know, here in the U.S. and in, in, uh, in, in patients with uh, blue and green irides. And um, because the amount of, like, you know, the iris pigment epithelium is, is definitely less than in brown irides. Uh, but there is only so much pigment that can get released. And actually, um, there is a um, natural, his the natural history of the condition is that it actually improves on its own after like, you know, some time because like, you know, all the pigment will have been uh, rubbed off of the um, areas of the iris that's, uh, that are in touch or in contact with the um, zonules. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, don't I don't have a, 
this is not something that comes to my mind the first thing when I see a patient with kidney disorder, to be honest, but it makes a lot of sense to me. The very bad thing about bilaparfine is actually uh, its effect on the ocular surface. Uh, it's, it has a horrible effect on the ocular surface with time, and that's unfortunate because it's a good drug. Uh, we belong to the area of the carpian and, and, uh, and that was it. So uh, it, it is horrible to the ocular surface. I can attest to that. So, uh, Dr. Abd Hamid, would you like to go ahead, please, uh, yes. with your presentation? Dr. Abd Hamid uh, is going to talk to us about uh, uh, some of his interesting cases in malignant glaucoma. Actually, I will talk today about nanophthalmus and glaucoma. And um, we are showing in this slide different age groups because our disease presentation and management differ among different age groups. Um, this is the clinical spectrum of the small eye phenotypes. We are talking mainly about nanophthalmus, which is the last one in this uh, table. Um, uh, however, some ophthalmologists by mistake exchange the nomenclature between nanophthalms and posterior microphthalmus. However, the two terms represent two different conditions. Nanophthalms show a short axial lens with small anterior and posterior segments, thickened choroid and sclera with normal lens volume. On the other hand, short axial lens, uh, posterior microphthalmus show short axial lens with normal anterior chamber dimensions. Uh, are these cases commonly seen? Actually, yes. Uh, they are represented genetically on six locations. Three of them are autosomal dominant. So uh, uh, in autosomal dominant fashion, we might see uh, a, a lot of the nanophthalmus running in families. So once you catch a case, if you are tracing his brothers or sisters, you will find uh, similar conditions with variable degree of the pathology. These are some of the typical ultrasonographic and retinal features of nanophthalmus. Um, axial lens, short axial lens, thickened sclera and choroid, serous retinal detachment, choroidal effusion, shallow anterior chamber, angle closure, anterior rotation of the iris lens diaphragm. Also, uh, the spectralis OCT showing prominent choroidal and retinal folds in this small eye. Also, foveous cases and choroidal folds. This is colored picture showing the optic disc drusen, chorioretinal folds, and crowded discs with mild vascular tortuosity. This is also a picture for papillomacular folds. And it's nice to show that these folds do not involve the retinal pigment epithelium. So the term posterior microphthalmus is not synonymous with nanophthalmus. Although both conditions are characterized by shortened axial lenses and high hypropia, yet in nanophthalmus, the anterior chamber dimensions are decreased. Corneal diameter is less than 11 millimeter. Whereas in posterior microphthalmus, the anterior segment is of normal or slightly abnormal size. Thus, the phenotype of posterior microphthalmus does not include the predisposition to angle closure glaucoma, which is part of nanophthalmus phenotype up to 70% of cases. Additional findings of posterior microphthalmus include retinal folds in 24%, occasional pigmentary retinopathy, and propensity for uveal effusion which are not common feature to nanophthalmus. 
Published reports and my own experience suggest that the posterior microphthalmus is a distinct autosomal recessive isolated ocular phenotype. Normally, the lens to eye volume ratio is about 4%. However, in nanophthalmic eyes, this volume ratio is more than 10 up to 30%, and still this progressively increase, increases with age. No role for medical therapy in nanophthalmic glaucoma before lens surgery. Pretrabicular angle closure, either early oppositional or late synechial, would encourage us to adopt angle surgeries after lens removal in order to regain drainage, goniosyneculysis together with lens surgery. So what type of glaucoma are we facing? We are facing a condition of chronic narrow angle glaucoma. However, it's not classical because it's not episodic, it's creeping, does not need precipitating factors, yet still precipitating factors can induce extra damage, and it does not follow the classical age presentation and profile of progression. The presentation varies according to age. Young people usually want to get rid of their high plus lenses. However, cornea laser surgery does not offer satisfying results. Also, the customized IOLs are not usually available with high plus powers. So we are adopting a two-staged refractive intervention plan from the very beginning to give better results and avoid refractive surprises. This will encourage early intervention. The trend of not giving solid promises to be spectacle-free after surgery will abandon the idea of lens removal, so underestimating the actual long-term benefit of lens removal. We have two options for refractive error correction in such cases. The first option is the single step, two piggy bag IOLs, yet pigment dispersion, interlenticular opacification, and still progressive angle narrowing can still occur. Or the planned two-step surgery for more refined results. The second step deals with the residual refraction as an affectic state with putting the iris claw lens as a secondary IOL becoming suitable with more deepening of the central anterior chamber. And this is a clinical study in 2019 comparing the refractive outcome of primary piggyback intraocular lens versus secondary lens iris claw in posterior microphthalmus and nanophthalmic eyes. It was done to compare the refractive outcome of two different methods of intraocular lens implantation in cases of nanophthalmus and posterior microphthalmus with primary piggyback IOLs versus secondary iris claw lens. The study found that the primary piggyback IOLs showed less satisfactory results with cases of undercorrection and the possible complication of interlenticular opacification. Both groups showed good safety parameters. However, we are facing difficulties in diagnosis of glaucoma in anophthalmic eyes because of the fallacious IOP measurement due to changed corneal biomechanics and curvature, which would affect the validity of applanation tonometry. Also, the central corneal thickness factor should be included as it will overestimate the values. Optic nerve head size in these eyes is small, so slight cupping, which is the only sign of glaucoma, might be missed easily. Visual field might be misleading due to high plus lenses used, amblyopia, and posterior pole folds that might be present in such cases. So its benefit is more after discarding the spectacles by good refractive outcome when it is used as a baseline for further follow-up. Spectral domain OCT is the most beneficial and reliable for establishing a baseline for follow-up. Also, gonioscopy is technically difficult due to steep and small corneas, but still can be replaced by anterior OCT and UBM. Glaucoma surgery is hazardous in nanophthalmic eyes because of poor drainage of the vortex vein due to thick sclera, characterized by abnormal collagen fibrils, leading to high incidence of supraciliary and supracoroidal effusion, which needs prophylactic inferior quadrants sclerotomies. Because of high incidence of malignant glaucoma, we should consider routine peripheral iridohyalidectomy together with lens surgery, vitrectomy with violation of the anterior hyaloid phase, and even routine post-operative atropinization. Also, the deeply set orbits and limited episcleral space will make space for glaucoma drainage devices not in capacious for adult devices. 
So single plate Moltino or even the pediatric size of Ahmed valve might be used to avoid optic nerve compression accidentally. Evidence-based medicine does not offer guidelines in such conditions. And pussy segment findings might delay and encourage surgeon patient couple to proceed for lens surgery. The laser use in such conditions is very much limited. YAG iridotomy, peripheral laser iridoplasty, comprise only limited and temporary value. Endocyclophotocoagulation together with lens surgery should be limited and using low powers. Diode laser cyclophotocoagulation is risky as it is not calibrated and can lead to thysis bulbi. This is an example of uh, our cases done in the study. And this was a secondary artisan, a artisan implanted in a 18 years old male. As we can see, he has an IOL in his bag. This nanophthalmic eye had an axial lens of uh, 16 millimeter and he had post IOL implantation plus eight diopter glasses, which was corrected with the artisan implantation. As we can see, this is the pentacam of this patient and his AC depths increased from 2.2 uh, millimeter to 4.4 millimeter. This is the IOL master for such patient and it's of no benefit for implanting the artisan. We are relying upon the affect state and calculating the Needed. This is the first case for management of nanophthalmic glaucoma. This is a 41 years old female patient with nanophthalmus with chronically narrow angle glaucoma and microcornea, high hypropia plus 17, congenital nystagmus, crowded optic discs, and presented with poorly controlled glaucoma despite having peripheral iridotomy and iridoplasty. Despite maximum medical treatment in the right eye, she underwent trabeculectomy with mitomycin. However, she developed malignant glaucoma, shallow anterior chamber, iridocorneal touch, 360 degree pusisanechia, and visual acuity dropped to perception of light. So, she was referred to the vitroretinal service for management of her cataract and underwent right parsplana vitrectomy, lensectomy, goniosynecolysis through a parsplana approach, pussy capsulectomy and anterior capsulectomy, capsulotomy and cryotherapy, and he needed tamponade with C3F8. This is the second case, a 34 years old female with an anophthalmic eye plus 10 glasses managed by total lensectomy and vitrectomy. Her intraocular pressure was 30 millimeter mercury with maximum topical therapy. This resulted in widening of the angle by OCT from 16 to 40 degrees and needed a thicker glasses plus 20. IOP controlled to 12 millimeter mercury using maximum topical therapy and iris claw lens with maximum power reduced the spectacles later to plus seven diopter both eyes. This is the third case, a 54 years old male, nanophthalmic, as we are seeing very shallow anterior chamber, and the cornea rigidity is different from uh, normal eyes. He has chronic narrow angle glaucoma due to man nanophthalmus. His right eye was managed with phacoemulsification together with peripheral iridohyloidectomy. His IOP improved from 36 millimeter mercury to 14 millimeter mercury with du dual topical therapy. So, we are abandoning the penetrating trabeculectomy from our practice now in dealing with any chronic narrow angle glaucoma in nanophthalmic and non-nanophthalmic eyes to avoid serious conditions that might occur as malignant glaucoma and supracroidal hemorrhage and effusion. And we are adopting the angle surgery to break any pre-trabecular block together with lens removal. This is the angle surgery in chronic narrow angle glaucoma, either the classical uh, rigid trabeculotomy, trabeculotomy under deep sclerectomy after phacoemulsification, or the proline 5O guided elegant GAT in pseudophagic patients with postoperative gentle uh, follow up with minimal postoperative steroids in a conjunctiva sparing technique. It's not time consuming, done under helon after meiosis with certain OR settings to visualize the nasal angle.
And this is a proline 5O guided 320 degree trabecula trabeculotomy, ab externo, under deep sclerectomy, with preservation of the trabeculodescent membrane together with phacoemulsification. This will allow us to identify clearly the termination of canal of Schlem. So we are happy with uh, identifying the termination of canal of Schlem and then cannulating the ends of the canal of Schlem with the uh, proline and doing the 320 degree trabeculotomy in order to preserve the trabeculodescent membrane and maintain the surgery in a closed system avoiding the penetrating condition. As we can see in this chronic narrow angle, we are not seeing any seepage combined with phacoemulsification. And this is the creating the bulb at the termination of the proline, implanting and cannulation of the proline. then doing the trabeculotomy, but trying to preserve the window. So you do angle surgery and FACO together in this case, right? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Mustafa, please unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Alhamid, uh, Professor Alhamid. We, we, we enjoyed that very much. Uh, do you guys have any question for Dr. Alhamid Houthi? Uh, yeah, my, my question was, uh, like what, what? Why would you? Why would you go for a posterior lensectomy in 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 certain cases and leave the the patient um, aphakic as opposed to you know putting an intraocular lens and going for an interior based approach? Actually, I learned the condition the hard way. I did the trabeculectomy in such cases, and unfortunately, uh, I faced malignant glaucoma more than once. And when you are talking with your patient, you are uh, detecting his priorities. The priority of the patient uh, who is young and looking for uh, a spectacle-free condition, not caring about his glaucoma, or if he is not yet in a glaucoma state, differs from a patient who is already uh, been on therapy for months and years and complaining of the condition of elevated intraocular pressure. So uh, I can adopt the technique of uh, lensectomy and vitrectomy. This will put me in a very safe situation. Sometimes, sometimes I do lensectomy with peripheral iridohyalidectomy as a routine, as I mentioned, in cases, uh, 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 in other cases, which is still uh, might be totally safe to prevent malignant glaucoma. But, but wouldn't aphakia make your uh, glaucoma risk higher and increase the, the risk of you know, developing a worsening of angle closure afterwards? Look, after lens surgery in such cases, I did a lot of cases, uh, especially for uh, refractive issue. Uh, looking for the angle and seeing the effect of lens removal on the angle totally will put the condition of the eye in a safe position as regards angle closure. Actually, um, 
I have been doing in nanophthalmic eyes, um, like, you know, just anterior approach cataract surgery, and then I would do, I would put in a lens for sure, and then I do an I redo zonulo hyaloidotomy with the vitrector. So I go with the, like I put an AC maintainer and then I go with the vitrector. I make a peripheral iridotomy, go through the zonules and then into the vitreous cavity and this just makes it a unicameral eye. And um, yeah, I've had good results in the few cases that have done that way. Yes, I, I have been <laughs> adopting two techniques of iridohyridectomy, Dr. Mohammed. Either I do it totally from uh, uh, anterior approach in a perpendicular fashion, uh, either with a surgical iridotomy followed by a perpendicular cutter through this iridectomy in order to complete the unichamber uh, I am looking forward, or in a two-manner uh, approach from anterior segment and, and pars plan approach in order to uh, complete the task. So what we're doing here is our first line is basically uh, lens removal, but you know, a regular FACO anterior approach. We don't do the posterior lensectomy approach. So we do a regular FACO with IOL implantation. Uh, and sometime we add to that uh, scleral windows. So we do uh, sclerectomies uh approximately three to four uh, millimeters away from the limbus to decrease the risk of choroidal effusion and choroidal uh, complication post-op and if the pressure doesn't go down after FACO then our and I think uh, Dr. Tommy can, can comment on that uh, one of our best option would be uh, cyclophotocoagulation using the, the classical diode uh, because shrinking the ciliary body uh, in our hands, you know, in those patients um, improves the angle. It opens up the angle by rotating the ciliary body posteriorly, and it also decreases the aqueous humor pro the production, and it works quite well uh, in, in, in those eyes. And it's a non-incisional procedure, so you don't have all the risk related to, to incisional, uh, to incisional uh, surgery. Any, any comment on that, so, Hamad uh, or Karim? Uh, yes, and the chamber actually becomes significantly deeper when you shrink the uh, ciliary processes. Um, yeah, I, I, I Muhammad, done, any comment? Yeah, I have done also ECT, and you can see the the, the shrinkage yourself, like you know, before your eyes and the um, you know the iris moving backward. And uh, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The, 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 the only thing is that, you know, I, I never combine lens extraction to cyclopotocoagulation in those cases because you never know how they're, they're going to react and you can end up having, you know, horrible complications like choroidals, hypotony, uh, etc. So I, I, I usually use a stepwise approach, uh, lens extraction first, and then uh, the cyclopotocoagulation would be done as a second line if, if needed. Can I make a comment? Uh, it's a great, excellent, excellent presentation. So thank you for, uh, for, for your great points. So, so my approach, is, my approach in, in those cases is similar to Mohammed's. I start with lens extraction and then routinely add uh, iridozonilo hyalate with rectomy. And uh, in, in, in almost every patient to, to avoid, to, to prevent malignant glaucoma. And, and, and sometimes um, I add the goniocynical lysis um, in, in almost most of the cases. So uh, the question is, uh, so, I, so you, you showed some uh, cases and you, you performed uh, angle surgery together with uh, cataract surgery combo procedures. So in, in which patients you combine, in which patients you combine the, the angle surgery and, um, and the, the cataract or it ear, does only heal highly the check. Look, um, if I have um, intraocular pressure more than 30 and the anterior mm -hmm. OCT shows uh, extensive prefa anti cyanica and prefa aridocorneal touch, I would go for uh, uh, lens surgery routinely with iridohyalidectomy. This is my routine in such cases. However, I will go for angle surgery as a second step if I didn't reach my target pressure uh, uh, with, uh, with, with uh, satisfactory treatment. 
uh, I mean, uh, which, in which patients you do uh, both in the same session, I mean, so uh, you, in, you never know. Uh, in nanophthalmic uh, patients, I didn't go for both patients in the same session, actually. Okay. But I do, I'm doing, uh, 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 yeah, I, I prefer to do them to approach. If I didn't lower the intraocular pressure by my first uh, approach, I will go for mm -hmm. another one. However, in other chronic narrow angle glaucoma, I can combine the lens surgery together with angle surgery in the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's what I do. When you get a deep anterior chamber after iridozonal hyaluronic vitrectomy and the lensectomy, you can go ahead and do angle surgery. That's what I do. And GAP is, uh, is another uh, perfect option in, in these cases. I have a couple of cases. Sure. Uh, yeah, that, that, uh, in which uh, I did GAP surgery after iridozonal hyaluronic vitrectomy, and it works very well. And you know, you're working in a, in a closed system, so it's very safe. Yes, that's why I'm recommending not lowering the intraocular pressure, especially that you don't know a target pressure and you are having fallacious intraocular pressure with the thick cornea. So if you are not happy with the first intervention, you can proceed yeah. with angle surgery as a second uh, step. As a second However, in other cases, in chronic narrow angle claim cases, not due to nanophthalmic eyes, I would mm -hmm. go for both combined lens surgery and angle surgery at the same session. Exactly, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, it, chamber, it, it those... Sorry, go ahead, chamber, go ahead, Karim. Uh, if the chamber remains shallow, as it often does after in nanophthalmic eyes, even if you implant the lens and so on, and if it remains shallow, to my mind, angle surgery would fail because the iris can go back up and get stuck. So you have to deepen the chamber somehow, be it by... Uh, uh, limited vitrectomy, as you described, or by uh, uh, cyclophotocoagulation. Yes, I, I don't have experience with endocyclophotocoagulation, and I don't face any shallow anterior chamber if I do routine lens extraction plus uh, the iridohyloidectomy. And in the patient, in the female patient, I mentioned that I uh, uh, did for her total lensectomy, vitrectomy. Uh, after discussing with the patient, the main concern of this patient was the glaucoma. That's why I left her a fecic. She was uh, totally concerned about glaucoma. So uh, doing total uh, vitrectomy, lensectomy, put her in a nice condition, very deep anterior chamber, very deep angles, and the intraocular pressure got back uh, uh, very nice. And I was, she was subjected to secondary artisan IOL, uh, which didn't uh, increase their intraocular pressure second time. Um, just a small comment concerning angle surgery in those patients. You know they have uh, they have a very weird anatomy with uh, with the very thick sclera, and I wonder how are how is the anatomy of the collector's channel in in those patients? You know, are those normal collector's channel normal episcleral circulations like? What would be the, the success profile uh, and the success rate of angle surgery, uh, whether it's KDB or GAT in patients who, who have such an anatomy, an ophthalm, uh, anophthalmic patients? Actually, yeah, the three cases I mentioned in the, uh, uh, the, in the uh, termination of my uh, presentation were not uh, uh, nanophthalmic eyes. I just recommended angle surgery as a technique to abandon any penetrating trabeculectomy. But I did, uh, 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 the, the only one in nanophthalmic eye was the uh, uh, 320 degree trabeculectomy under deep sclerectomy. Mm -hmm. I did okay. the GAT in nanophthalmic eyes. But I think when I have a case which uh, I didn't get intraocular pressure improved after the traditional lens surgery and prefa idahidectomy, I will try for the gut. Uh, I hope the steep cornea uh, and the small cornea will help me. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no experience with gut in anophthalmic patients. You know, when it comes, uh, because I think it's, you know, it's a totally different ball game. But when it comes to chronic angle closure glaucoma, I think angle surgery is a, is a great option. There's this a great paper from uh, Cyril Dorairaj that was published recently on the combination of phaco emulsification, goniosinicolysis, and Kahuk dual blades. 
uh, and they they reported amazing results with uh, with this approach. You know, basically the, your phaco emulsification opens up your angle uh, goniocinic lysis to release you know the synechia and exposing the trabecular meshwork and adding the KDB to excise you know this uh, uh, this sick. Uh, trabecular tissue and opening up um, uh, your outflow system and th this I think makes sense as an approach to to chronic angle closure uh, uh, glaucoma. Muhammad, are you combining uh, phaco to KDB and goniocinicolysis in in patient with with angle closure glaucoma? So Is yes, angle closure glaucoma. I would do a um, my standard approach is cataract extraction. Uh, goniocyanicid lysis, ECT. This is my trio. Um, but if the um, if actually the uh, PAS is extensive, and I don't have really a cutoff, like you know how much of the angle is uh, is really affected by the PAS. But I judge it if it's long standing and it's extensive. I don't bother, and I go for a combined uh, phaco tube. So, so why would you favor ECP over, let's say, KDB in such in, in such cases? Because I feel that um, the it, it, it's not only the um, internal um, uh, the internal uh, limit of the uh, Schlem canal that is the issue. It's not only I think that like you know PAS and angle closure kind of affect your outflow in so many different ways that we don't understand. And um, if I'm inside the eye already, um, I would do the ECP and um, it would actually help pull the iris backward as the uh, processes kind of shrink. And I, it, like, you know, I, it, it makes sense. Um, I just haven't been doing that. I haven't been doing the um, combined kahook with, uh, like, you know, the goniocyanicolysis. I think that goniocyanicolysis would do the job if whatever um, angle function is still, like, you know, remain. Good point. Can I make a comment on that? And uh, Ziad uh, touched on a great point, uh, an angle surgery or GAT surgery in cases with you know, so This is a great point. So I'm now collecting uh, data uh, in, in those patients because we really don't know the, uh, the angle anatomy, the, the distal uh, collector channels anatomy in those eyes. So I have a couple of patients. Uh, I did GAT, as I mentioned, uh, right up. Uh, after the, um, once I get uh, the large anterior chamber after the iridosonal hyaluronic vitrectomy in non ophthalmic eyes. So I tried GAT uh, in those patients uh, to treat the chronic uh, trabecular meshwork dysfunction and uh, chronic glaucoma. And uh, I tried to uh, do GAT. Uh, and in a couple of patients, now I'm collecting data, in a couple of patients, it, it was really hard to trap the suture circumferentially. So there might be some maybe obstructions, some, I don't know what's happening in the canal. So it's hard to, to get it circumferential. It's hard to thread it circumferential in, uh, in non-ophthalmic eyes. This is my uh, clinical observation. But once you get uh, half of the way, you know, this is something, it's safe, but it's, it's hard, hard to, 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 to uh, make it circumferential in those eyes. As you said, we don't know the anatomy in these angles. Uh, I, I'm, I just wanted to convey the message to um, our colleagues that I would not uh, recommend penetrating trabeculectomy at any point during managing such cases. Also, I would not recommend uh, placing uh, devices, Ahmed Valb or Mortino, uh, uh, cases, and lens surgery to, is not enough also in such cases. So uh, lens surgery, especially in glaucoma, already glaucomatous, uh, is not enough. However, lens surgery might be enough in young patients seeking for refractive surgery, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, with certain precautions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Hamid. Dr. Mustafa, you can unmute yourself as well if you want. 
I was offline for a second there. Thank you very much, both of you, uh, Mohammed, Zainab, uh, and all of you, and, and Hamid as well. That was very interesting. And now we move on uh, and ask Dr. Mohammed to uh, present his case uh, of uh, too short and too uh, exposed, please. Um, Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I have no financial disclosures. So um, I remember this case vividly as it was um, one of the first cases that uh, presented to me when I became an attending at Bascom Homer. So um, it's a, then it was a 68 year old female. I've known this patient for um, two years already. And um, the, she had a history of pathologic myopia uh, she was pseudophagic in both eyes, had lattice de degeneration with multiple breaks, uh, with a history of retinal detachment in both eyes that uh, was repaired. The left eye had three retinal detachment surgeries. Um, she also had very bad thyroid eye disease with uh, severe exophthalmos um, that resulted in um, presumed compressive optic neuropathy uh, that like we were not sure of because the patient also had glaucoma that was documented beforehand. Um, and uh, she had undergone orbital decompression in both eyes, once only in the right eye, but twice in the left. She had a lateral tersorophy uh, in both eyes, but her eyelids were very friable. And in the right eye, she had the lateral tersorophy repeated three times. Um, very bad trichiasis, um, was having a cryo treatment almost every month, and um, had a long um, history of uh, primary open angle glaucoma or a mixed mechanism glaucoma, and had a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C in the left eye in the year 2001. Uh, in the left eye as well, she had a DSAC, uh, anterior basement membrane dystrophy, and she had a severe ocular surface disease in both eyes, and she was monocular. Only the right eye was seeing. The left eye uh, had a um, physis bulbi. Um, the uh, medications, she was on Travitan, Cosopt, and Brimonidine in the right eye, and prednisolone and atropine in the left eye. The um, vision, no light perception with a uh, uh, hypotenuse left eye. Uh, the right eye, 2060, despite all this, uh, surprisingly, but the pressure was 32 on um, four uh, molecules. The central corneal thickness was um, more or less normal in the right eye, um, thick in the left eye. Um, on examination, um, the right eye, I'm going to focus on the right eye, the, had uh, an extensive lateral tersorophy. Actually, her uh, um, fissure, her um, palpebral fissure was very small, barely actually exposing part of the cornea. Um, the conjunctiva, when I asked her to look up and down, right and left, was very scarred from like all previous um, retinal detachment surgeries. And inferiorly, the conjunctiva was completely adherent to um, the um, underlying sclera. Uh, the cornea was, um, you know, a little bit hazy, like, you know, acceptable, semi-clear centrally, uh, but she, has, uh, she had some sort of, like, you know, exposure despite all the, um, the, the despite the tersorophy, she had, like, punctative erosions extensively in, in the inferior half of the cornea. And, uh, but the, 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 like, you know, the gonioscopy was very difficult, by the way. Anterior chamber was apparently deep and quiet. The iris um, was okay, pseudophagic. The uh, cup to disc ratio was 0.7 with mild pallor, and uh, the macula was okay. So, what, um, should we do for this patient with a pressure of 32 monocular with all these um, like, you know, comorbidities, ocular comorbidities? The options are basically trabeculectomy or cyclophotocoagulation, which can be micropulse or continuous wave, or a tube 
Um, Ziad, what would you do? You can unmute yourself, Ziad. Yeah, so I, th I think given the description that you gave, you know, the scarring of the, the conjunctiva and uh, the severely altered ocular surface, you know, really compromises the chances of success of the trabeculectomy. Um, so it's either a, a cyclophotocoagulation or, or a tube in that case. You know, the tube would be extremely challenging. Uh, uh given the anatomy that you're you're working on the fissure uh i, I would i would probably go for cyclophotocoagulation as a first line with a slow burn if if i cannot put a tube in uh, i think it's going to be very challenging to put a barvelt in uh or or an ahmed in if the if the fissure is is so so narrow and the surface uh, and the ocular surface so scarred Zainab, what would you do? You can't do Gatti. You. you can't see me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm just forcing myself <laughs> to look uh, in other direction. But trabeculectomy is tricky, and tube surgery is also tricky in, uh, in a patient with the conjunctival scars, and cyclophotoagulation is like that. So, yeah, I can, I can uh, definitely, uh, would, I would check the angle first to do GAT. Uh, yeah, I can I can do GAT, but uh, in uh, among these options, um, I can uh, I mean I would try uh, cyclo first and then go for if, if it doesn't work I, I can go for tube surgery. Okay, yeah. so that's what I did. So I chose to um, go for a CPC. Um, uh, again, bear in mind, like, you know, this was like, you know, probably my first week in Baskin Palmer as an attending. I really didn't want to, like, you know, be all that heroic. And I just wanted to, like, you know, be under the radar. I just chose the least invasive option. Um, so I went for a, um, a cyclophotocoagulation that is continuous wave with a slow burn setting. So... Um, I did 18 spots, the power was 1250 milliwatts, and the duration was four seconds, like Dr. Abdul Hamid had uh, described earlier. Um, Postoperatively, day one, the pressure was 22. I had the patient resume um, COSOPT, of course, um, in addition to, um, you know, two hourly steroid drops. At week one, the pressure was like, you know, slowly escalating. Um, so um, I had the patient at 26, I had the patient resume bromonidine as well. Week four, the pressure is 44. So I decided to go for a second procedure. What would the second procedure be? Dr. Abdul Hamid, what would you do? Uh, you are, you're muted, so can you please unmute yourself? Uh, I think I would like to keep uh, the cyclophotocoagulation, even the slow coagulation technique for the very last uh, option, as a very last option. So I would start with a valve uh, with good dissection, prepare myself with free conjunctival uh, graft um, from the other eye if available, if he's one eye with um, amniotic membrane or uh, graft. So I would prepare myself uh, with uh, with uh, ambient ambient coverage for the conjunctive. Dr. Tommy, what would you do? Please unmute yourself. Uh, you mean after the, uh, the the first after the first CPC with a pressure of forty four after four weeks monocular patient? Uh, I guess your options are quite limited to either another session of. Uh, cyclophotocoagulation which can be risky uh, or a tube as was said but uh, i'm not sure the conjunctiva would allow the proper dissection and, and closure to implant a tube but certainly if a tube can be implanted uh, maybe that's more predictable okay right so i actually opted for another um, cyclophotocoagulation. I still wanted to remain under the radar, not like, you know, no invasive surgeries at that point um, in a difficult patient. So I did another um, transclerocyclophotocoagulation 
but um, I increased the, the number of spots, like, you know, the other settings remain similar. Um, day one, um, after the second CPC, the pressure was 30. I resumed both Cosopt and Brimonidine in addition to um, uh, two hourly steroids. At week one, the pressure was great. It was 16. I was very happy. I continued both Cosopt and Brimonidine. Week four, pressure slowly escalating, you know, 20 on, on all three drops. Week six, fresh, pressure is 48. And mm. I had the, to make the difficult decision to go for a third procedure. So the third procedure, like, you know, if I did another CPC and expect a different result, that would um, not be too smart. So I'm, okay, I'm not going to do a third CPC. I'm going to go for a two. So um, the two options are either a non-valve tube or a valve. So either a bar valve or an amet. So the bar belt would give me uh, better longevity and better control. And it's actually my prefer. I, I rarely uh, use the amens, but um, I'm, I prefer very much the bar belts. And now I also do the clear paths. But in that case, like, you know, the pressure was really high. The bar belt takes um, like six weeks to start functioning because like, you know, you, you put in the ligature plus minus the... Uh, um, uh, intraluminal stent or uh, ripcord suture. Um, so I really wanted something to lower the pressure immediately. So I went for an amid glaucoma valve um, for, uh, to, uh, to achieve early pressure reduction. But now, where would I place that valve? This is the difficult question. So we have four quadrants, superior temporal, infranasal, superior nasal, infratemporal. So superior temporally, the axis was very difficult because of the lateral tersorophy. Infronasally, like there was severe scarring. Infrotemporally, it was both severe scarring and difficult axis. So I was left with only superior nasal quadrant as the only option. So this is what I did. And I chose the uh, superior nasal uh, quadrant for AGV implantation. Postoperatively, day one, uh, the pressure was 13. I started the patient on dorazolamide, and this is uh, my routine when I put in an AMET to uh, minimize the chance of uh, a hypertensive phase. So I start patients with a pressure higher than 10 on, a, on an aqueous suppressant, typically a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor on day one. On day seven, the pressure was nine. I was very happy. The patient, the patient was very happy as well. Pressure started escalating. So at month one, the pressure was 19. I switched the dorsolamide to COSOPT. At month two, the pressure was 36. And I did a very difficult gonioscopy to find, I, I couldn't see the tube. I really, like I was able to see the tube prior to, um, like in, in, in previous visits, but I couldn't really visualize it in the anterior chamber anymore. And I do a gonioscopy, and I see that actually the tip of the tube is embedded in the angle structures. I can hardly see it or recognize that there's something that's completely clogged. And um, by asking the patient to um, look downward, like, you know, I see this, like, you know, exposure as well. So I decide to go for a fourth procedure. And this was the procedure. I place in a... Here, I'm going to pause for a second. So you see the temporal tersorophy. You see, like, where all the eyelashes are. And, like, you know, this is actually the pediatric size um, speculum. I couldn't fit in a um, regular size speculum. This is, like, actually the neonatal speculum, if, if, if you want. And, Just a question um, here, uh, Muhammad. What, what the, the the shape of the pupil seems not to be irregular. Am, am I seeing this right? Uh, and I, I don't know why. And I, I wrote that the pupil, like if you go back, if I go back to the exam slide, I wrote that it's a surgical pupil. I, like you know, I think it's probably a difficult cataract surgery or something. I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure. Um, so, um, but you see here all the conjunctivalization of the cornea and, and, and all that. 
But uh, again, uh, like we see the uh, tersorophy here, and I actually spoke with Dr. David C., the um, you know professor of oculoplastic surgery. I told him, can we cut the tersorophy? And he said, please don't, please just work around it. Th this patient has very friable tissue, um, eyelid tissue, and it would be very difficult to do the tersorophy again. So I placed the um, seven ovicral um, traction suture. And here, like, you know, we can see that the tube is exposed and I try to actually open the conjunctiva. And it was like that even like, you know, the first time when I did the tube, it was very difficult. And you can see how like, you know, it's like completely adherent to the underlying sclera for like, you know, a couple millimeters behind the cornea. And we see the exposed tube key here is to try to undermine the conjunctiva as much as possible. So you want to, um, you know, have to relax all these adhesions. And um, I removed the tube, I injected viscoelastic through the sclerostomy, and I closed the sclerostomy with a 7-0 um, um, in a figure of eight fashion to make sure that, um, you know, the sclerostomy is well closed. And one reason we do um, close the initial sclerostomy is because if a patient has, uh, the, the, a tube has exposed, it will continue to expose every single time you revise it, but leave it in the same place. You know, you need to change the microenvironment of a tube in order to avoid re-exposure. So, um, the, Sclerostomy is being closed here. And we see how like, you know, like very, very sick ocular surface. And I'm trying to like, you know, create as much like, you know, space and uh, have as much conjunctiva to work with. And um, I'm cutting all the adhesions, severe, severe um, adhesions between the conjun and the sclera. And, um, you know, again, I'm trying to mobilize the conjunctiva to cover, to see like, you know, how I'm gonna cover my tube. Um, and then I decide to cut the tube off because it was too short and then connect it to a tube extender. This is an Ahmed tube extender. So this goes in, you may actually leave it as is like I did here or actually fix it with a, a nylon suture, an 8 nylon. Now this is an 8 nylon in the, um, you know, here, I'm directing the tube away. I'm directing it to the superior temporal quadrant and um, I'm placing the um, uh, 8 um, nylon suture to fix the extender to the sclera and the other eyes as well. And now I'm making a completely new sclerostomy using a 23 gauge needle. And I'm tucking in the tube in the eye. Now, how am I gonna cover this. So I chose to cover it with a tutoplast pericardium patch graft. I suture that to the underlying sclera with a uh, 7 micro. Everything was difficult. I, I was already past one hour or like one hour 15 minutes at that point um, in surgery. So I fixed that to the sclera, covered the extender very well and covered the tube. Um, I stopped using the tube extender and I now use a different technique which we can talk about later. But, um, so here I think that like both are very well covered by the pericardium patch graft. Now, like, you know, again, Will the conjunctiva be mobilized enough to cover all this or not? You know, it's like, you know, all my sutures keep cheese wiring. I, I kept placing series of um, mattress sutures, horizontal mattress sutures. And I take scleral bites of the limbus. And 
finally, I was able, I'm gonna actually fast forward a little bit because the closure is gonna take a long time. To, the closure took like, you know, an hour by itself. But I was happy that, um, you know, I was able to close it. It looked great at the end. I was very, very happy with myself at that point. And, okay, the post-operative pressure, day one, the pressure was seven. Day seven, the pressure was nine. One month after the surgery, the pressure was 13 on no medications. Four months, the pressure was 12. And this is the last time I saw the patient. Um, and uh, the last time I spoke with, with one of my colleagues in Bascom Palmer who took over the care of um, the patient told me that the pressure remains in the low teens and I'm um, quite happy. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. That was great. That's a really tough case. Any comments, guys, before we go? Um, uh, did, uh, didn't you try, uh, 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 when you, uh, if you remember the, the case of um, uh, 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 abexternal 320 degree uh, um, uh, trabeculotomy under deep sclerectomy, when I was dissecting the sclera, uh, it was very hard and it was very much fibrotic. And after relieving the deep flap and uh, uncovering the, the trabeculodesmant membrane and finding no seepage, I was happy. Because uh, depending on uh, any seepage on, or any conjunctiva in such condition will fail. So I proceeded to 360 degree sclerotomy or 320 as I mentioned. So what I want to say is that even in such fibrotic sclera and such fibrotic conjunctiva, you can still, uh, through the deep sclerectomy, you can find your way to an intact canal of Schlem. This is number one. Number two, uh, in a lot of cases where I do the Ahmed valve, I rely upon uh, using free conjunctival graft instead of uh, doing uh, this tough work you have uh, went through. This is my two comments. Thank you. Thank and you so welcome. much. Uh, so just commenting about the conjunctiva and how it was really attached to the sclera. So this is uh, like, you know, the surgery that I didn't show, the initial implantation of the Ahmed uh, uh, valve. So, um, I actually couldn't cut with, um, you know, my blunt um, Westcott scissors, and I had to actually use um, initially uh, the uh, Vanna scissor to, to cut through, and it was very difficult. So I actually also used a 75 blade to cut the conjunctiva. So I, I really would don't know whether like you know trying to make a scleral dissection and all like you know this severe scarring uh would, would i would get anywhere um however here like you know really we have a very low threshold for using tubes and this has been the 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 subject of uh debate over the past few weeks in all the glaucoma webinars on like you know the the preferred glaucoma procedure um, i always go for a tube i do primary tubes i have no issues with the with primary tubes but this was like a case that was really different and um, um just unlike like you know the the other routine cases that I usually do. Ziad, do you have a comment? You're you're muted. Uh, I have Super. a couple of comments. Oh, sorry, Ziad, go ahead. Yeah, so I, so I was saying that that's a, that's a nightmare case, and and you did a, an amazing job on uh, on that one. Uh, uh, I, I'm not using any of those, you know, tube extenders or parse plane clips because they tend to, to erode like, like mm -hmm. crazy. Um, yeah. uh, I, and I think, I think you, you alluded to that. I think you're doing the tube and tube, uh, tube, tube and tube. tube tech That's what I do now. Vaccine. So, um, it, I just use a, a curved McPherson to, um, like, you know, actually, uh, make open it up, open it up and just tuck the second tube in. And it's much easier and it's much less bulky. 
and uh, um, just just one question you know when when you when you dissected the when you dissected the conch and you and you removed your your tube from the from the interior chamber uh did you consider at a certain point you know flushing the tube just to uh I did uh, do that. It's just not I, showing in the video. Oh, okay. Great. So it, it, it's an excellent case that it's like really, really well, well managed. Uh, impressive case, Muhammad. Thank you for presenting that. Thank you. Uh, Thank Karim, you. you had a couple of comments? Uh, yeah. The first one was about the tube extender, but you, uh, you covered that. The other thing is in these stubborn cases, uh, it becomes justifiable to use even uh, systemic carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and you don't you may not need, need to go to very high doses you know we have uh, we have gotten away quite often with uh, doses as low as a quarter of a tablet twice daily and that doesn't give a lot of side effects and it may work quite well I, I certainly luckily you know this patient end up ended up being controlled but if the pressure goes up again, then uh, I wouldn't go to another cyclodestructive procedure and there is certainly no room for another tube. So a low dose of Diamox may be well justified and may work. This is an excellent case, Mohammed. Thank you, Zainab. And you did a great job, you know, tough case, bad ocular surface, you cannot see the angle, it's scarred conjunctiva, you don't have the space to put the tube in, it's, it's a great job. Thanks for the case. So I might do maybe, uh, uh, I, would, I would think uh, to perform an ab external surgery like, uh, like mentioned before. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mustafa. All right, so I think Dr. Mustafa is uh, Thank like, you. Uh, having issues. Sorry, um, uh, we need to round this up. Uh, uh, Adil uh, from. Hello? Yes, Dr. Mustafa, we can hear I you. I lost. Uh, I'm unmuted. Hi. Uh, I I thank you, every, thank you very much for this wonderful thing. Uh, I think we raised more. Uh, I think uh, 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 Dr. Mustafa Ali would like to tell us, uh, uh, would like to talk to us for a few moments. Uh, Dr. Mustafa. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mustafa, and thank you for all uh, our professors for the great uh, uh, lecture of today. We learned so much from, uh, from it. Uh, uh, briefly, we are talking about our products. Uh, as a pharma medica, we have pharma breast as a bromidine tartrate of 0.2% as anti glaucoma. We have pharma tumogen, a uh, fixed combination between bromidine tartrate of 0.2% uh, plus stimulol milliate of 0.5% uh, as an anti glaucoma. We have pharma as a benestin hydrochloride as an anti allergic. We have pharma bread as bromidine as 1% uh, corticosteroid. We have pharma uh, as a gatifloxin 0.3, uh, fourth generation fluoroquinolone antibiotic. We have uh, pharma tears as a carboxymethyl cellulose uh, 0.5% as an artificial tear. Uh, thank you very much, uh, our professors, for the great meeting. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for attending this. I think we, we, we may have to uh, gather again sometime later in the future that the questions uh, are still coming in and we need to answer some of them. So uh, maybe another webinar. Thank you very much indeed. That was a wonderful not, job. Thank not, you, everybody. Not so late, please. No, not so late. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's too late for me to... <laughs> Thank you. And sorry, Mohammed. congratulations for your wife. And uh, we hope uh, you can catch the rest of the celebrations. Thank you. Thank and you so congratulations much. for her. Thank you That very was much. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.